This little mini PC is completely silent, zips power, and actually has a pretty unique set of features. On paper, it seemed like a perfect fit for all kinds of roles, maybe a home theater PC, a tiny home server, or even a custom router. But once I got my hands on it, things didn't go quite as expected. Some of what I found was genuinely disappointing, but other discoveries left me pleasantly surprised. It definitely wasn't what I thought it'd be going in, so let's talk about it. As with many of my videos at this point, this one started with me browsing eBay. I've seen a lot of these Z-Box systems from Zotac, but I'd never taken a closer look at them, and eventually I figured maybe I was missing something. There are a bunch of different models out there, but the CI-325 seemed to be one of the more common ones, so that's what I picked up. It's definitely a bit on the older side, but these often sell for under $50, and apparently come with dual NICs. With its small size, I figured it could fit into quite a few rolls around the house or within a home lab. And with those dual NICs especially, I was thinking you might be able to install something like PFSense or OpenSense to build a software router, giving you more control over your network and even letting you route your traffic through a VPN, like the one from today's sponsor, Private Internet Access. A VPN is a really helpful tool to have in your tech tool belt. It helps keep your traffic private, so for example, your ISP can't throttle certain types of traffic. And sure, I know some of you have set up your own VPN servers, and that's great, but PIA works really well as a backup, and it also gives you access to tons of servers across 91 different countries. I've been using PIA personally for over a year now, and it's been absolutely rock solid. I love that I can use it on all of my devices, from my phone to my desktop, and even servers running Linux. In fact, one of my favorite ways to use PIA is by setting it up as a VPN provider for a Docker container called Gluten. This lets you easily and automatically tunnel a bunch of other Docker containers through PIA servers. I've been running that specific setup now for over a year, and like I said, I haven't had a single issue. Plus, PIA has a strict no-logs policy that's been verified by multiple third-party audits. So if you're looking for a reliable, affordable, and feature-rich VPN service, make sure to check out PIA by using my link in the description. That'll get you 83% off, plus an extra four months for free. Now, I would never recommend buying a system unless you've thoroughly researched it, but for these videos, I like to have a bit more fun by going into things somewhat blind. So all I really knew about this Z-Box was that it had four gigs of RAM, a 64 gig SSD, and an Intel Celeron N3160. The N3160 is a quad-core mobile chip that was released back in 2016. With a TDP of just six watts, it was commonly used in fanless embedded platforms for things like industrial automation and digital signage. It's a true quad-core with a base clock of just 1.6 gigahertz, and it includes Intel's HD Graphics 400. One of the things I first noticed when I pulled this system out of the box was that while the outside of the case was plastic, it had a nice weight to it and felt nice and solid. Well, aside from what sounded like a loose screw rattling around on the inside. On the outside, the system has some pretty decent I.O. On the back, there's a 5.5 by 2.1 millimeter DC jack for a 19 volt power supply, VGA, DisplayPort, and HDMI outputs, two USB 2.0 ports, as well as a USB 3.0 port, those dual gigabit NICs, and a connector for a Wi-Fi antenna, which wasn't included in the one that I bought. On the front, there's the power button, an SD card reader, headphone and microphone jacks, and two more USB 3.0 ports, one of them being type A and one being type C. There's also an IR receiver for a wireless remote, though I don't have anything to actually test that with, but it seems like it works with a variety of universal remotes, as well as one that Zotac provides. Before tearing systems apart, I typically like to check and make sure that they work properly, but with this one, well, I figured just powering it on right away might not be the best idea. To get the bottom cover off, there are four screws that also serve as the rubber feet. I was a bit confused here because they had this Phillips pattern on the bottom, so I figured maybe you could actually use a screwdriver to get them off, but that wasn't the case, you just unscrewed them by hand. Now, sadly, after taking off the bottom cover, I realized that this eBay seller had completely scammed me. This wasn't a 64 gig SSD, it was actually a 60 gig SSD. So, I'm just kidding. Regardless of the capacity, I probably wasn't going to be using it. I could also see the Wi-Fi card in an M.2 E key slot and a single four gig stick of DDR3L memory. And I also found that loose screw. I removed the SSD and got the system all hooked up. And while the listing didn't include a power supply, I was able to use a pretty standard 19 volt power adapter. Had to press it really hard, I guess. The system booted up just fine, but not to a UEFI shell or settings menu like I might've expected. It booted into Windows. Interesting. There's more storage here. Clearly there was at least one other drive somewhere in this thing, which I wasn't expecting. To find that, as well as anything else that might be hidden inside, I powered down the system and started trying to get it fully opened up. Now, for some reason, I was hoping this would be easier to work on than some other mini PC systems, but there was a surprising number of parts and screws to remove, and a dumb warranty sticker. 
After removing just about every screw, bracket, and standoff that I could find, I felt like I should have been able to get the board out, but it just wouldn't budge. I was at least able to pop off the rear I.O. cover, which made me feel like I was making a little bit more progress, but the motherboard was still just stuck. The only two screws left were clearly for the CPU heatsink, which I didn't think you'd need to remove just to get the board out. But after a few minutes of nothing else working, I unscrewed them and, well, sure enough, the board just fell out. At this point, I made three discoveries. First, the system was passively cooled with a massive heatsink and no fan. Considering I didn't do any research beforehand, this was actually a really nice surprise. The second discovery was that that heatsink was screwed into the top of the case, which is just really dumb in my opinion. The only way to get the board out and back in is to remove the heatsink, which means reapplying thermal paste. Now you might be thinking, well, how often do you really need to do that? Well, as often as you need to swap out my third discovery, this SSD right here, which judging by this spider next to it, hasn't been touched in a long time. I'm not sure how useful 32 gigs really is, so I'll definitely be swapping that out at some point. But first, I really needed to get this thing cleaned up. Before completely reassembling everything, I wanted to try swapping the M.2 SSD. Now I had a feeling this was a SATA only socket, but since it was keyed for both M and B key drives, I decided to give an NVMe drive a shot. It only supports 2242 and 2260 length drives, and the only shorter NVMe I had was this little 2230 guy. But I came up with a quick and dirty way to keep it in place, but as expected, it wasn't detected. So instead, I dropped in this 2242 128GB SATA SSD, which worked just fine. Now this wouldn't be my first choice, but since Windows was already installed when I got this thing, I wanted to see how well that actually worked. And the answer was, not well. Not well at all. I'm sure the single 4GB stick of RAM played a role in how badly it handled even basic desktop usage, but the CPU seemed to be the real bottleneck. It was pegged to doing just about anything. Opening applications took ages, and web browsing was a chore. With the H.264 Fi extension, YouTube playback at 1080p was solid thanks to the integrated graphics, but the overall YouTube experience was still just very unpleasant. The lackluster CPU performance showed up in benchmarks as well. I got my lowest score ever in Geekbench 6, where all four of the N3160's cores performed about as well as just a single core from an AMD FX6300. And no, this bad performance didn't have anything to do with the passive heatsink because CPU thermals were actually pretty good. I was patient enough to let Cinebench R23 finish, and it managed single and multi-threaded scores of 191 and 663 respectively. That's nearly the lowest score I've ever recorded, just barely edging out another fanless PC I tested which has an Intel J1900. Well, it at least outperformed it in the multi-threaded benchmark, because I guess back then I wasn't patient enough to let the single-threaded benchmark finish. For comparison, I also grabbed results from an HP Elite Desk G3 Mini with an Intel i5-6500T, which isn't that much more expensive on the used market. And this absolutely obliterated the Z-Box, at least in terms of CPU performance. When it comes to power draw, the Z-Box with its N3160 was actually pretty decent, only pulling 12 watts under load and around 7 watts at idle. Now compared to some modern systems, that's not mind-blowing or anything, but it does mean that this could be a nice low-powered system that won't spike your electricity bill or heat up your room. Now I did also try installing Linux Mint to see if things improved there, and they definitely did. But I should note that by this point, I had upgraded the RAM to 8GB, which probably helped a bit as well. But Linux Mint was a noticeably better experience. File browsing was snappier, video playback was even decent with some 4K files, and web browsing was definitely smoother than on Windows. That's not to say it was a great experience, though. It was still a bit sluggish at times, and you're definitely limited in some ways, like only being able to stream media using certain codecs and resolutions. At the end of the day, I really don't think this is the system you want if you're looking for a small, lightweight desktop machine. But using this as a desktop isn't the only potential use case. One I mentioned earlier was using this as a router with something like PFSense or OpenSense. However, one unfortunate discovery I made was that those two gigabit NICs use Realtek 8168 controllers. Realtek NICs have a pretty bad reputation when it comes to FreeBSD, which is what both OpenSense and PFSense are built on. I decided to give it a shot anyway and installed OpenSense. For the WAN port, I hooked up one interface to my network, and then hooked up the second to a small switch for a LAN port. To my surprise, both NICs were immediately recognized and working with the stock drivers, which hasn't been the case for me in the past, so maybe that's a recent improvement in FreeBSD or OpenSense, I'm not really sure. That's not to say I didn't run into any issues, such as the WAN port just not working after a few minutes, so I did end up installing the Realtek drivers using the available plugin. That definitely seemed to help. When testing with a self-hosted instance of Open Speed Test upstream of the router, I was able to get pretty close to full gigabit speeds. Now, the CPU was spiking quite a bit while doing that, so I'm not really sure how well this would hold up with more devices, more complex routing rules, or additional plugins. 
Hardware checksum offloading was disabled by default, which is recommended for real techniques for stability, but I tried toggling it on anyway to see if the CPU usage would go down. But this really didn't make that much of a difference, and might not be worth it for stability's sake. Still, it seemed to work fine overall, and the N3160 does support the AES NI instruction set, which helps offload encryption and decryption tasks. This means that if you're routing traffic through a VPN, the CPU shouldn't have to work as hard, and you won't be bottlenecked as much by encryption overhead. While this might not be the perfect solution for a software router, it seems that it could be decent for smaller networks, or if you're on a sub-gigabit internet connection. It could also be a solid option if you're just wanting to set up a secondary network for testing and experimentation. If you're not looking to use it as a router though, this could also work pretty well as just a lightweight, low-power server. And for this, I actually decided to swap back in that 32 gig SSD to see if it could still be useful. Now, running a hypervisor on a low-powered CPU with limited RAM probably isn't ideal, but I went ahead and installed Proxmox anyway. I like Proxmox because it gives me a lot of options for flexibility, and lets me test things pretty quickly using some of the community scripts. After getting Proxmox installed, I ran PowerTop Autotune and Auto ASPM, and with the display unplugged, the system was now only drawing around 4 watts. That's pretty darn good, especially for a nearly decade old machine. Now obviously with just 32 gigs of storage, I wasn't going to get very far, so I also dropped in a 1TB SATA SSD for some extra space. This is also when I upgraded the RAM from 4GB to 8GB. Even with that RAM upgrade, you're not going to be using this system to run a bunch of VMs or CPU intensive services, but I figured it could be great for lighter workloads. For example, I installed Home Assistant OS using the Proxmox community scripts, and within a few minutes, I had a bunch of devices set up and everything was running smoothly. Another role in a home lab this Zbox could fill is for monitoring. I set up Uptime Kuma, but you could easily run other tools like Prometheus for example. Or you could even connect this to a UPS and use NUT to monitor for power outages and safely shut down other systems. Since it draws so little power, this is actually kind of perfect for this job. It can stay up longer and make sure other machines that might be drawing more power can shut down safely, and those dual NICs might still come in handy here depending on how your network is configured. Before moving on from Proxmox, I also wanted to confirm whether the Wi-Fi card slot supported PCIe. So I dropped in a little SATA adapter to test it, and sure enough, it worked. Now it's only a single lane of PCIe Gen 2, but still, this opens the door for some interesting mods if you decide to get a little bit hacky. Another thing that I think mini PCs can be great for is serving as retro game emulators or lightweight streaming PCs. I gave Batacera a shot to test out some emulation, and with older consoles like the NES, the N3160 seemed to handle things just fine, and it even did okay with some N64 emulation. But moving up to something a little bit more intensive like the PlayStation 2, well, yeah, this just wasn't going to happen. So unless you're just wanting to play very old consoles, this probably isn't the best option for retro emulation, but it might be good for media streaming. Batacera includes the Kodi Media Player, and with that I installed the Jellycon add-on to stream from my Jellyfin library. This worked fine for some content, but it seems like this client only supports direct streaming. That was okay for 1080p H.264 content, but when I tried to stream something like 10-bit HEVC, things came grinding to a halt. For some reason, the Jellyfin server wouldn't transcode the stream, and I couldn't find a way to change that. The iGPU in the system does support QuickSync for hardware-accelerated video decoding, but it only works with certain resolutions. I switched back to Linux Mint to see if running Jellyfin in a browser would work better, and in the setup the server did handle transcoding so playback was much better. However, I kept getting dropped frames which made the experience pretty choppy. And this wasn't just with transcoded content, even direct streams were also getting dropped frames occasionally, so I'm not really sure what was going on there. Regardless, given how low powered and dated the system is, I just don't think it's a great option for media streaming, which is a bummer because the HDMI output does support 4K at 30Hz, and it also has that neat little IR sensor that might be great for a living room setup. But performance wise, it's just not quite up for the task, especially when compared to other cheap options out there. As of filming, it doesn't seem like there are many of these available for under $50, but I've seen plenty of sold listings in the past going for substantially less. If you happen to come across one in the $30 to $40 range, it might be worth checking out. That said, the performance of this little guy isn't particularly impressive, especially when compared to some of the priced products on the used market, like some of the tiny mini microsystems, or even other Z-boxes that have better specs and appear to be a much better deal. Also, they're kind of a pain to work on, especially if you want to swap out that M.2 drive. I was honestly a bit disappointed with this machine. After seeing so many of these Z-boxes on eBay and Facebook Marketplace, I assumed they'd just be little interesting workhorses, but it definitely wouldn't be my first choice for a budget mini PC. That being said, it probably wouldn't be my last choice. If all I needed was an efficient little box for something like Home Assistant, or a simple OpenSense router, it'd probably do just fine. And I'm pretty sure there are plenty of other potential use cases for a system like this, so if you have any ideas, let me know down in the comments below. While I was a little bit disappointed, I definitely enjoyed my time with this little Z-Box, and I hope you guys had fun watching as well. If so, maybe consider giving a like, subscribing, or even becoming a raid member for as little as a dollar a month. With that, you get early access to all of my videos with zero ads, which I think is a pretty good deal. 
That's about it for this one though. So as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay curious. And I really can't wait to see you in the next one.